check. Can everybody see that correctly? Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you very so much. Well, first of all, thank you for Lamas for having me. My name's Andy Peachy and I work at Archaeological Solutions. Um, I'm here to present this to you as very much a team effort of different specialists that have been involved this evening um, and I hope to acknowledge a few of those as we go along. But first things first, um, I'm here tonight to introduce a late Bronze Age site in the far east of London at Wennington in the borough of Havering. The site is characterised by the presence of a classic founder's hoard, um, but unusually one found within the context of an enclosure rather than in isolation by field walking or metal detecting. I hope this creates a new frame through which this conspicuous deposition may be viewed. When thinking about how to present the site, I kept being drawn back to the visual aesthetic, the shiny reflective surfaces of the original bronze items and how bright they must have looked in an otherwise very naturalistic landscape of marshy greens and browns. This was rather emphasized by the glaring sunrises and sunsets over the former marshes that extend to the west of the site towards the River Thames and captured on these photos. In seeking visual analogies for this, I kept hitting upon a late 19th century painting entitled Sunset Over the Marsh by Martin Johnson Head that characterises the artistic movement of luminism, which is focused of the, on the effects of light on the landscape. And I promise this isn't a massive deviation from prehistory, but I hope to demonstrate that it's the setting of this site and its relationship to river and marsh, as well as specific depositional context, that will allow us to add fresh evidence to how we consider founders' hoards. So overtly, I may talk a lot about metalwork, which is not my natural environment, but I think the site provides both a natural and historic stage, especially given its prominent square shape, um, upon which the hoard is the sole surviving character that we can interrogate. not going to be coy about the presence of a hoard, but I will say more about its reveal as we go on. However, first a little about the nature of the project. You may have seen adverts for what has become known as the Havering Hoard at the Museum of London Docklands, or even been to visit already. It's open until April. Um, this represents an exclamation mark in what is an ongoing commercial project, with the pace of at least partial analysis being analysis being rapidly accelerated by potential public engagement. The site was and is part of a quarry that will supply sand and gravel um, to London for some time to come. It's being operated by Ingrebourne Valley. Um, and although this excavation by Archaeological Solutions was concluded towards the end of 2019, we have just concluded um, an adjacent phase on the same quarry and will be returning again in near future. So there is much more to be revealed. Normally, the analysis and write-up of such a project may extend over the following years, but after a visit from Roy Stevenson, acting as a champion for the Museum of London exhibitions, and in coordination with Adam Single of the Greater London Archaeological Advisory Service, as well as members of the Portable Antiquity Scheme and Historic England, the excavation and indeed the post-excavation process was reshaped and targeted to be driven by the design and opening of this exhibition rather than the typical process towards an archaeological publication, which will come. I'm sure most of you don't need an introduction to the geography of the Lower Thames, but a quick look down on where we are and some of the principal Late Bronze Age sites close by, courtesy of Google. Our site sits just one kilometre to the north of the current channel of the River Thames. Let me just highlight in red here. It's a short distance to the south of late Bronze Age settlements at South Hornchurch, Hunts Hill Farm and Hackton. The former included a sword mould from on-site metalworking and the latter a further bronze socketed axe. Even more pertinently, less than a kilometre to the east on Sandy Lane Averley, a hoard of bronze was recovered in 1968 but remains unpublished. Slightly further east, we have the large ringwork settlements at Mucking and Chadwell St Mary. Mucking, the most well known of late Bronze Age sites in the area, produced a vast finds assemblage, 
um, including moulds and implements that indicate the presence of a bronze refractory, most recently published in 2016 in the monumental Lives in Land monograph. The ring work at Chadwell St Mary, published this year in BAR, produced an extensive post everall Rimbury pottery assemblage and characteristic perforated clay plates, but curiously, no metalwork. The East London gravels, as Harvey touched upon in his introduction, must now be one of the most well-explored prehistoric landscape zones in the country, mainly due to mineral extraction. So, it's abundantly clear and well established that we are in the middle of a fairly densely populated for the period landscape. It's aligned along the resources provided by the Lower Thames, most notably the access provided by the river and estuaries that extend to the coastlines of Essex and Kent. This is most aptly demonstrated by this map lifted from Timothy Champion's paper on the characteristic perforated clay plates found on many sites in the region, including this one. They appear a common domestic component, possibly associated with ovens and bakings, food drying or curing, possibly salt production, but almost certainly not metalworking. I've also marked on Broomfield Chelmsford, a little farther to the north up here, um, because it's an enclosure that I'll come to for comparison shortly. The gravel terraces that attract mineral extraction today were equally favourable for late Bronze Age settlement. This geological plan illustrates how the site at Wellington is situated on the projection of those gravels overlooking former alluvium that is derived from the now drained marshes that once bordered the river. The common watercourse and mar dike are situated to the northwest and southeast, and narrow spurs of alluvium either side of the site suggest that it was once hemmed in by further small inlets. Here and here. The result is that the site is enclosed on three sides by natural barriers, with a terrestrial facade and access from the northeast. Very swiftly to demonstrate the impact of the former marsh and how much of a shoreline, natural resource and barrier it may have provided, I'm going to show this 7070 map. It's clear habitation off the gravel terraces was not an option, or at least not a pleasant one, even then. And the river at this point effectively becomes an even wider corridor. Almost moving on to the here and now, and prior to beginning trial trench and then open area excavations, it was clear through aerial photo evidence that we had a square enclosure within the site. Nonetheless, if you had asked me for a prediction, I'd have probably said Iron Age to Roman rather than Late Bronze Age, consistent with so many other farmsteads also excavated on the gravels. But to what we did find when we stripped the site. Stripping off a wide area revealed a square enclosure corresponding to our crop mark in the southeast corner here. And it's that area that I will come to focus on, which was rapidly dated to the Late Bronze Age by pottery. Adjacent to the west was a messy arrangement of post-medieval quarry pits exploiting the gravel. And further to the west are a series of field boundaries ranging from Roman to post-medieval. But more interestingly, the western part of the site was covered by a layer of alluvium that combined with the apparent absence of prehistoric features sealed by it, suggests that the marshland may want to have extended and encroached almost to the rear of our late Bronze Age enclosure. Zooming in on the enclosure, here we can see how it appears when cleaned prior to excavation and once it had been fully excavated. The initial methodology was to excavate a 50% sample of the ditch in segments, but as the hoard was discovered fairly on in this process, it was decided that the entire enclosure would be 100% sampled, excavated and sieved. You can see we have a full circuit of the ditch with a single entrance to the east, with slightly expanded ditch terminals to either side of it, and a cluster of post holes in the centre here. We also have uh, a set of four posts in the centre, and a second set of four posts 
just outside the western edge of the enclosure. There are sparse other post holes and pits and a few tree throws in there that are maybe contemporary. Without jumping too far ahead of myself, I've marked the location of the hoard in yellow, but first we can look at the broad structure of this enclosure. On this plan, we have a central roundhouse and we have postulated that the central four post structure here may have been a fairly aggrandized entrance um, to that structure. However, we have equally postulated on different plans that this might be a separate structure that acted as a marker, a monument in itself, or even in a barrier to deliberately break the line of sight between the entranceway and the door of the roundhouse. Um, in the northeast corner of the enclosure, we actually have some ephemeral post holes and a hearth that may result in a second roundhouse, possibly more likely um, a working area. I've also highlighted in pale blue um, two pits, one at the top right of the screen and one here, um, simply because these contained by far the highest concentrations of prehistoric pottery on the site and likely represent rubbish pits associated with this occupation. The pottery is also the greatest indicator we have of rubbish deposition, as prehistoric bone survival in the damp and acidic soils was virtually non-existent. Before I delve in further, just a quick video clip to provide a further idea of scale for the enclosure. You can see we're excavating segments at this point through the ditch before we remove the spits in between for 100% excavation. You would also see at the end one of the four post structures in the foreground, again, just for an idea of scale. The post pits for these four post structures are much more robust than that of the roundhouse. I should also note that the misty cold weather was rather typical throughout. The function of the central four post structure is thrown into greater question when we examine the placement of the four post structure immediately to the west of the ditch. And both of those are marked on red squares in this map. Here and here. Using my fairly crude schematic, um, we have a clear alignment east northeast to west northwest that runs through the entrance of the enclosure through both the four post structures, the roundhouse and the location of the hoard. Intriguingly, the entrance is on the opposite side of the enclosure to the river and marsh, potentially opening onto a route which would run along the edge of the marshland, leading towards sites such as Mucking to the east. In the bottom right, I've also put a very, very basic representation of four posts stuck into the ground, just the idea of the amount of variation that such four posts could support. Given the location of the hoard, it is clearly being deposited with relation to the water, but deliberately not in it. Suggesting this was not a kind, the kind of wet offering in which objects were deliberately disposed of, irretrievably so. It also raises the possibility that many bronze items previously recovered from the Thames may not have been deposited in the river, but washed out of similar bank or marsh side locations. The component of this that intrigues me the most is not actually the physical hoard, blasphemy to many, but the odd four post structure outside of the enclosure. The alignment of the enclosure and structures means the sunrise will shine through the entrance, possibly given the slight northeasterly tilt at an optimum around the summer solstice, and the sunset will cast light across the river and the marsh onto the shielded area of the hoard. However, I can't help feel that the entire construction is as much aligned with respect of the river, acting as a transitional space coming off the gravel terrace towards the marsh, to an area of sorry, restricted activity. Did this western four post structure act as a platform, as a marker or shrine, or most speculatively, did it support some kind of access between the roundhouse and marshland, potentially passing over the hoard? <clears throat> I 
That conspicuous deposition was focused on the western arm of the enclosure may be supported by the seemingly more mundane distribution of pottery. As I've previously mentioned, the highest concentrations of late Bronze Age pottery are actually in pits just outside the enclosure. But if we look at the distribution of sherds in the enclosure ditch, there are significant biases. There are modest elevations of sherds around the terminus of the entranceway and limited quantities in the north and south arms, which may have been recut and scoured in prehistory. But strikingly, in the northern half of the western arm, adjacent to the horde, there is a significant concentration of sherds represented in this part of the graph here. But this is only on one side of it, possibly suggesting that the area beside the roundhouse was the focal point of domestic or more enigmatic consumption. I'm going to touch very briefly on the nature of the pottery mainly because unlike the metalwork, it will not be fully recorded or analysed until further excavations have been concluded. We have the expected range of post Deverell Rimbri vessels, those the ceramic style that spans the late Bronze Age to early Iron Age, including coarse and fine calcined flint tempered fabrics, a range of bowls, jars and cups with single rows of fingernail decoration on the rim or shoulder, occasionally with applied thumb impressed strips on the larger jars and often with flint gritted bases. <coughs> Here we have the base of a particularly fine polished bowl with a distinctive omphalos base. That's the circular kick at the bottom um, and in size grooves on the body. But what must be said it's a quantity of pottery and vessels is commensurate with relatively low magnitude domestic activity. Presuming the site was in use for a modest duration, and I'll come to that, the assemblage was likely generated by a small domestic unit, paling into insignificance compared to the populations supported at Mucking and Chadwell St Mary. This begs the question, why such a small group associated with such an enigmatic site? Are we looking at voluntary guardians or stewardship of the site? Was the site and its contents, be it metal or people, deliberately kept off limits? Was there a societal acceptance that a small group separate itself from the larger settlements, but logistically still be in reach? <clears throat> Sticking with limited domestic activity for one moment, and as much to confirm parallels with other local sites, the enclosed area produced low quantities of perforated clay plates whose distribution was mapped by Timothy Champion on the map I used earlier. If these were associated with an oven or hearth on the site, then their low quantity suggests it was quite singular. Similarly, one of the pits in the same area produced a complete cylindrical loom weight, probably enough to weigh down a single warp beam, and that's the taut vertical threads on a small loom. <coughs> More importantly, the survival of these fired clay objects act as a control sample. Their preservation suggests no other fired clay, such as moulds for bronze objects or other evidence of metalworking, had become so friable and degraded that they did not survive, that they really are absent despite the large scale accumulation of bronze. One final enclosure thought before I focus on bronze. This is Broomfield, Chelmsford which has a very similar shape, almost identical dimensions and an entranceway, and a principal roundhouse. It has a similar pottery assemblage and clay plates to our enclosure, but no evidence of any metal deposition. Also, like our enclosure, it is slightly removed from seemingly larger contemporary centres of settlement, namely the ringwork at Springfield Lions, Chelmsford which includes evidence for a bronze refractory even more substantive than that at Mucking. So might we be seeing a distinction of contained nodes within the landscape with a similar design, or is it merely coincidental and these are small domestic units effectively in orbit to larger centres? They seem a little too conspicuously different to me. I spoke earlier about the change in methodology moving to excavate 100% of the enclosure. 
This was prompted when the first part of the horde almost fell out of the, se the section of a ditch. Um, one of the segments that was being cut through was given a really nice vertical face and immediately the sandy soil crumbled away to expose the telltale green of bronze objects. Um, the red line I've put on here is where the original section was and you can then see back where it was, it was duly cut back um, to properly allow for the excavation for what on the day was assumed to be a single small group of, of bronze objects, soon to be realised as a rather larger hoard, even just in that one group. As it was assumed to be a single entity, what would become known as Hoard 1 was carefully cleaned and excavated on site due to the time constraints of a Friday afternoon on a large site in winter that could not be secured from the threat of illegal metal detecting. As layers of the hoard were cleaned and removed piece by piece, the scale of this deposit increased. You can see here a degree of arrangement in the sorting of objects as they emerge, with a layer of axes providing a fantastic image at the top of the hoard. This may evidence sorting as the hoards were accumulated or packed, or possibly the natural movement and settling of objects as they were carried, but I'll return to that shortly. I mentioned time constraints and the surprising number of objects that emerged from the first group of bronze. As a winter's afternoon and evening closed in, the objects were meticulously recorded and lifted, with the team continuing to work by torchlight until after 9pm to make sure they had all the material. Um, the image of working by torchlight really is a testament to their determination to the cause, if you like, and that they weren't going to uh, leave any stone unturned um, and unsafe. Um, it's kind of become a signature image for this project, which is really rather atypical for what we would expect and hope for on an archaeological excavation. <coughs> Lo and behold, when returning the following week, the team began to excavate the ditch segments adjacent to the hoard, um, only to encounter a second, third and then fourth group of bronze objects. Phone calls to report their status to the office came rather thick and fast that day. Because of the exponential increase in magnitude and greater time now available in a new week, these three groups were excavated slightly differently. They were loosely cleaned, um, wrapped in cling film, bandages, tape with a board slid underneath so they could be block lifted and loaded into a van, which is no mean feat because they weren't light. From there, they could be delivered to a laboratory and into the wonderful hands of Pieter Greaves, here on the right, um, who could micro-excavate them in controlled conditions to retrieve as much information as possible before conservation began. Hmm. Um, I'll let this run for a moment, but this um, sort of stop motion of Horde 2 demonstrates the very invisible hands of Pieter as she dissects um, the second group. What you can't see is between frames, she is labeling and numbering every object. Um, so we can go back and check the individual placement of items. At this point, we had to deviate slightly from normal progress, driven by the public engagement I touched upon at the start of the talk. Normally, we would ask Pieter to clean and conserve a large proportion, if not all, of the items, but the Museum of London had requested to keep a large part close to the state in which they were found, partly for the purposes of exhibition and a sense of realism. So Pieta checked all of the items to make sure they were stable and would not corrode, and she x-rayed every single one. Um, she conserved only a selection of items, so the photos that um, I come to show later will show bronze in varying conditions from shiny to dull um, as far as the conservation process allowed. So, what do four groups of metal look like once they've been taken apart? I am indebted to Dr. Sophia Adams for these pictures and much of the photos and information that follows on the metalwork. Uh, she was the specialist that received the bronze for the next stage of recording and specialist analysis. 
I'm going to summarize some of the salient points of the Horde briefly, otherwise I'll be talking metalwork into the night. Um, however, I should say that any emissions and any errors on metalwork are entirely my own, and Sophia has su supplied us with an absolutely fantastic specialist report that I think we're still in the process of digesting the tiniest parts of as we come to develop the archive report further. Hordes 1, 2 and 3 are similarly sized, comprising between 122 objects and 155 weighing between 11.1 .1 and 14.3 kilograms, with the weight difference primarily accounted to for the presence of large or smaller fragments of ingots. Horde 4 in the bottom right is noticeably smaller with only 45 items weighing 7.4 kilograms. It was also the uppermost in the ditch. It may be that this was a remainder of a single large group after the three earlier packages had been assembled and deposited. But it may also be that parts of it had subsequently been retrieved or removed after initial burial. It's also possible that each of the four groups is in itself a composite with layers that were themselves accumulated over time in the ditch or prior to burial, perhaps in the roundhouse. But I will explore this more as we go. I'm zooming in on hoard one to illustrate the mix in composition, but I'm going to talk through items lifted from across the hoards. There is a degree of consistency in the specific types of item common across the hoards, with some rarer pieces unique to each group. These place each hoard within the Ewart Park phase of the Late Bronze Age, circa 900 to 800 BC. You will also notice that consistently almost all of the items are represented by broken fragments. In fact, Horde 1 has only 20 complete items out of 131, just 15%, while Hordes 2 to 4 have less than 10 each. Um, and even the complete items are all broken and beyond practical or functional use. Furthermore, despite all attempts, there is not a single piece that refits to another across the hordes. Each fragment is from a separate unique item, suggesting in prehistory a very deliberate process of selection, which I'll return to in my conclusions. <coughs> Each hoard is comprised of 30 to 40% axes or pieces thereof, 5 to 10% sword fragments, 2 to 8% spearheads, with the remainder rarer implements and fittings or ingot fragments and casting waste. In totem, um, the Havering Horde compares well to the composition of other hordes from southeastern England, such as the Watford Horde in the Ashmolean Museum. However, the deposition of four hordes together remains exceptional, and some of the rarer items have a distinctive continental affinity that leads us to look out of the mouth of the Thames and towards northern France. One final eco fact that must not be overlooked um, is what sat between the bronze items. As Pieter excavated uh, the block lifted hordes, it became very clear that there was a significant amount of packing material in the form of straw, grass, possibly even reeds, that was preserved as mineralized material. Some of the mineralized material was adhering to the surfaces of objects, um, especially the flat faces of axes and swords. But unfortunately, the process of mineralization was too far progressed to allow for, for C14 sampling. The use of packing material raises some vexing questions. Firstly, if it is present, why is there no evidence, mineralized or other, of a container, be it basketry, animal hide, or even wood? Was the packing material introduced as the objects were buried, or earlier, potentially as the packages were assembled, on site? in the roundhouse or carried from an outside location. No container would have made transport difficult unless the items were tipped out along with the packing material. But if this was the case, they are very neatly formed in the ground and must have been tipped into holes that almost matched the containers in size and volume. <coughs> Secondly, the packing material helps inform on the arrangement of items in each hoard. 
as there are clear intermediate layers of plant material, especially in hordes two and three, possibly a byproduct of pockets of anaerobic preservation, or possibly by human agency. With the pictures of horde one earlier, we saw a clear layer of axes, um, with larger ingon fragments at the bottom and a more mixed group of spears, swords, and other items in between. Hordes two and three perhaps give a slightly greater impression of disorder, but some arrangement is visible. Hordes two appears to have axe fragments towards the top, with strap fittings, sword, and spear fragments below, before axes appear on one side, opposed to ingot, frag ingot fragments on the opposite side, with some spear and bracelet fragments in between, and more mixed objects below. The impression is not of a singular homogeneous mixed group, but almost like handfuls of different material assemb assembled to form each bundle. Looking at object types within the, or within the hordes, <coughs> axes dominate, primarily socketed types that are common in southeast England, some of which have wing, rib, or facet decoration, demonstrated by the six samples on the left. In fact, this variation is so great that no two axes appear to have been produced by the same mould, suggesting they were accrued from a wide variety of either metal workers or settlements in the region. Moulds for this type of axe would have been quicker and simpler to produce than for more complex or decorative types emphasizing that most people probably possessed at least one as a tool. But there is a subtlety to their design, and they would have had a different feel for different types of woodworking, different scale or chopping, for example, or maybe even for just for different people's feel in handling. Sparse other axe types, such as the Endwick's end winged axe on the right, um, do not contradict the dating of the hordes. All of our axes are broken in some way, and despite some casting seams remaining present, none are new or freshly cast. There just wasn't a focus on an aesthetic that we might have with brand new items today. In fact, many of the axe blades are heavily chipped by impact. Um, they're extensively resharpened, and many have splits in their sockets, which may have resulted from force pushed through the axe head in use. But a lot of the damage appears after use and related to the fragmentation of objects through hammering, battering, crushing, and splitting. Experiments by Matt Knight have shown that heating objects can assist the shattering of them into similar fragments to those in the hordes, which feeds our thoughts on the deliberate decommissioning of items and the selection of fragments from respective objects to be removed from circulation possibly removed from the recasting process. Like the swords, the spearheads are all Ewart Park types, primarily flame-shaped socketed types as the left and center examples. Other types include hollow bladed tip with small barbs on the right, and many of these also appear deliberately broken, with sockets that have been squashed and hammered or tips snapped across the blade. One spearhead, one of the limited items fully cleaned in conservation, revealed how finely crafted these items could be, quite beyond their primary function. Around the socket was decorated with incised bands, V shapes and dot motifs that really only would have been visible to the bearer or from very close quarters. This also tells us that the spear was rehafted, as the vacant peg hole is decorated with punched holes around it, while that with an intact copper pin is not, suggesting that it was pierced lower down the socket at a later date when a new handle was inserted. Sorry, once again, with thanks to Pieta for this video, I absolutely adore the uh, the subtlety to that decoration. 
The majority of the sword fragments belong to classic Ewart Park variants and have been fairly meticulously broken into small lengths. And I can't help think some almost appear to represent multiples of one, two or three of an undefined unit of measurement or approximate weight. I'd really like to do some more metric work on that. The fracture line on many of these fragments is often bent and rarely twisted where pressure has been applied to snap them. We only have two tips present, both also bent, while the hilt and handle fragments are slightly larger, presumably because they were harder to break. The central fragment is a particularly nice example because it preserves the pattern of rivet holes on the handle and the ricasso or unsharpened recessed section that sits between the handle and the ribbed blade here. It's quite irresistible to try and lay these fragments out to envisage a full sword, as you will actually see on the right um, fairly early after we've recovered these, although you will notice the handle on that actually belongs to a dagger or knife. In addition to the Ewart Park types, there are also a few fragments of carp's tongue swords, originally named because it's what they thought the blades were supposed to look like. They included more elaborate variants, such as this blade with groove decoration or veinette type paralleled in a hall at Charente in Western France. You can see the fracture on this fragment is also bent from where it was snapped, especially, oh, hang on. Yep. especially through here. Similar sword fragments were present in the Borstal Horde in, Frent, in Kent, but are far more common in others in northern France. Related to the swords in manufacture, Horde 3 was notable for containing both tanged knives on the left here um, and hogsback knives on the right. And you can see simply by the contrast in blade structure, these would have had incredibly different functions within the domestic sphere. Before I leave weapons or at least aggressive tools behind, um, I have to talk about this bag shaped shape, which would have sealed the end of a scabbard to a sword or knife. It's an exquisite little item that preserves another testament to the fine manufacture of composite weapons and fittings, of which mostly we only have the metal components left. The perforation in the shape preserves a tiny wooden dowel that would have fastened it to leather or cloth. Once inserted, this wooden dowel was fixed by a two millimeter wide copper pin that you can just see here, which would have expanded the dowel so it was snug in the fitting. Aside from weapons, the hordes included many other bladed implements, both for craft or possibly personal use. This is the only example of a symmetrical double-sided razor in our horde, alongside a reference example with a V-shaped notch and central perforation. A fragment of a similar razor was recorded in the Watford horde, associated with a type of looped back disc, also in this horde that I will come to. Equally sharp, and possibly my favourite implement in the, the, the whole assemblage here, are fragments of scythe in Horde 2. These have very, sh very shallow blades and are known as Minis Bay types after the Horde in which they were recorded in Kent. The edges are notched and worn, and one has to wonder if they were used for cereals and straw, as we typically perceive them, or whether perhaps they were used on the marshland reeds that would have served a variety of domestic function and were found immediately close to the site. These have also been fractured by bending in the same manner as the swords. This incredibly preserved awl is another tool represented by just one example, this time in Horde 2. It has a carefully crafted lozenge end on one end and originally may have been double-ended, perhaps with a finer point or chisel on the opposite terminus. It has a square projection from the mid-body, which doesn't seem to relate to its casting. This might have allowed a handle or other say, implements for, for leverage to be um, worked with it to allow it for turning and very fine woodwork. It really would have allowed 
an incredibly fine degree of woodworking. Possibly you wonder whether it was associated with lathes. Um, comparable examples are very rare, but are present in the Isle of Harty Hoard in Kent. <laughs> Lingering on woodworking, hoards one, two and four contain gouges that attest to the skilled craftsmanship, be it creating joints, sockets, carving or hollowing out wood. Um, these have a robust collar to strengthen the round sockets and a very sharp concave blade that is always slightly notched and worn on these examples. Again, like the, the axes, despite the completeness of these, none are freshly cast. <coughs> Thinking of what was being crafted in wood, it probably wasn't just structures, but potentially boats, horse-drawn carts or wagons. The latter would also have required harnesses or rope, or sorry, harnesses of rope or leather. While leather would also have been used on belts, straps and bags for the occupants. Rare fittings that attest to such harnessing include this looped back disc. Two small loops on the reverse would allow it to be fastened to leather or textile, but it's the bulbous rings on the front that catch the eye. When polished, these really would have been incredibly reflective. One of the highlights of the bronze items that speaks further of horses are a pair of rain rings, known as terret rings, with one complete example in Horde 3 and another fragmented in Horde 2. They almost certainly would have been a pair. They were designed to prevent the reins tangling on a cart or even chariot. Currently, no other examples are known in late Bronze Age hordes in Britain, although similar terret rings are present in hordes from La Chapelle in Normandy and Charente in Western France, highlighting continental connections, trade, possibly even the movement or commissioning of craftsmen. Such unusual items would likely have been deemed precious to remove from circulation, especially as they appear to have been a complete pair. Possibly they were deliberately broken and decommissioned. And one must speculate if these were voluntarily given, exacted or taken. Was the associated vehicle processional or even connected to the movement of goods, people or vessels from the highway of the river through the marsh to specific landing sites or settlements? Aside from people and power and craft, what might have been landed with such merit? The hordes contain significant quantities of bun-shaped ingots, all deliberately broken up, with the largest weighing 1.9 kilograms. These are formed of copper cake from the base of a furnace, and there is certainly no smelting on the site. They may have been imported from Wales, Cheshire, the southwest of Britain, or continental sources such as Spain and the Alpine region of Central Europe. Future scientific analysis may determine sources, but it seems certain not all of our ingot fragments come from a single source. Bronze Age specialists continue to debate the trade and supply of raw materials and the social context of smelting and supply. But here we have a substantive presence of ingots on a site that is at least superficially disassociated with the processes of smelting or casting bronze. The apparent absence of evidence for at least the casting of bronze within our enclosure, contrasts further with the presence of casting waste that has been accumulated and deposited within all of the hordes. They include jets, sprues and runs, seen here, that have occurred as molten bronze was poured into a mould and rose up, spilling out of the casting gates. So we must question, where did it come from and why? Clearly, this bronze still had a material value and could be recast. To somebody, it had enough value to be taken temporarily or permanently out of circulation and retained in our hordes alongside partial fragments of so many other implements. Before I try and bring together the site and hoard, one final bronze item. This wide bracelet was present in Horde 3, probably formed from sheet bronze or a very shallow hollow mould. It would have been highly reflective when smooth and polished, like our terror rings. 
And like our tarot rings, this is not a typically British item. Um, it's paralleled in a hoard in Cher in the Loire region of central France. Therefore, our continental connections through the River Thames seem even closer. It is exceptional in Britain to have four hoard groups deposited together, not simply in close proximity, but as a homogenous group, though that need not reflect a single event. We've looked at the nature of individual objects, but in typology, we can lose sight of wider human behavior. To our occupants, an axe was likely new, sharp, effective, or blunt, resharpened, or broken. But at either end of this narrative life, the birth and death, if you like, many have speculated on a spirituality perceived in the skill of manipulating metal. Or are we looking at a deeper economy, complexity in the accumulation and control of metal, possibly connected to socio-political structures. Firstly, the simple behaviours that are evident. The hoard was placed in four parts, seemingly in a single pit or depression within a partially silted up enclosure ditch. The relative consistency of each part indicates they are broadly contemporary but we can't be sure if they were deposited on the same day, week or season. However, the way the four parts are spaced out, about a metre between them, it's not quite social distancing, um, is enough for a single person to stand on a known spot and have the hordes passed down to them. Even more conceivable if the location was marked or accessed by a platform or structure, and I'm returning to those four post structures. Each hoard could be lifted and passed by a single person, but you wouldn't want to carry them far. I'm also still nagged by the presence of mineralized packing material, but no evidence of any form of organic container. Does the possible degree of sorting within the hoards indicate each part was not deposited as one, but built up over a period? Packing could be added as they went, no matter where the hoard was actually assembled. This brings me to possibly the one question that challenges the way we might perceive the enclosure and the placement of the hordes within its own narrative. It's clear that when the hordes were placed, the ditch was considerably silted up, possibly largely by material washed off the bank that overlooked it from the interior. Thus, the hordes were only placed about halfway up the depth of the ditch, with one even slightly cut into the bank. The immediate conclusion drawn from this, and one fitting some schools of thought on hoard deposition, is that this was a closure deposit, the ritualistic disposal of a conspicuous quantity of material as an offering, or to deliberately remove it permanently from circulation. I was never entirely happy with this, partly because given the location, if you want to achieve a dramatic episode of disposal, why not use the river or marsh and quite literally make a splash. But perhaps I'll give it the benefit and say it was related to the enclosure as a specific spatial entity. It continued to nag me as how I might postulate a reframing of this. One comment by a member of the excavation team, Anna Zupancic, prompted me to formulate an alternative theory rather than regurgitating varying theories on hoard deposition well established by my peers and betters who study the Bronze Age and metalwork. <coughs> Anna was looking at some of the graphics designed for the Museum of London exhibition, which are absolutely great work. And she said, I'm so glad they included hedges. I always envisaged it having hedges. And she's right. The wind can be so cold off the river and we have so many hedged boundaries across southeastern England but these leave little trace in an archaeological record, especially if they were atop a bank that has since eroded. So as well as considering the narrative of the life of the bronze items, I thought similarly about the evolution of the enclosure, which brings me to this. The ditch of the enclosure need not be constant, not only in its formation and erosion processes, but also in its function as its context within a human landscape changes. 
The enclosure originally appears to have been cut with a deep V-shaped profile and presumably a corresponding steep internal bank to act as a barrier, specifically a barrier. The site is in a wet environment and the ditch would have naturally silted up, aided by the weathering of the bank. Nonetheless, it would have remained functional as a drainage channel. And although sections of it may have been recut, it was certainly not extensively maintained as a deep defensive feature. So did it become and remain a border, not required as a barrier, but potentially with a hedge or similar vegetation, continuing to define it spatially? Most pertinently, per most pertinently, why might this transition have occurred and what does it imply for our hordes? <clears throat> if we accept either our hordes were accumulated offsite and brought to the enclosure, all that individual items or small groups were brought to our roundhouse with fragments selected and collated into the hordes, we must accept that valuable quantities of metal were moving through our landscape zone on the gravel terraces. The limited scale of artifactual deposition across our site suggests it was not occupied by a large group, be they associated with a wider community or not. So when this enclosure was established, were they not initially secure in their location, hence a very defensive V-shaped barrier? And if defensive, did the earliest activity on the site still depend on the accumulation and sorting of bronze, either as fragments, ingots, or broken items. And at this point, did insecurity dictate that the bronze remained a mobile above ground commodity that they could evacuate with and transport if necessary? <coughs> Over time, perhaps relationships within our Bronze Age landscape changed. Perhaps the occupants of our site and their activities no longer felt threatened. They no longer felt the need for a defensive barrier, but the enclosure remained defined. Perhaps the points of authority had established their role in the accumulation or movement of bronze. As such, access to the site was by consent and respect, fixed by societal and economic norms. Therefore, there was no consideration of flight with the heavy resource of bronze, and a cache of material as a temporary or permanent deposit could be maintained on the site in the form of our grouped hordes. This may chime with the location of the hordes in the seeming most restricted area of the site, physically and visually blocked from the entrance and seemingly enclosed on three sides by natural watery zones. To conclude, um, perhaps we can speculate on models of activity that flowed through our enclosure and created a transition or output that was our hoard deposition. These are purely speculative and of two models, parts of both may be true, but it is these that I believe reframe how we consider late Bronze Age hoard deposition, at least on this site. My first model works on the basis that only the final stages of accumulation and hoard deposition occurred within our enclosure. The left-hand column is simply the accepted first creation and lifespan of a bronze implement. We can postulate that our occupants acted as mobile carriers of bronze in a given territory, traveling between population centers and settlements, perhaps periodically or on constant rotation. To what end? Obviously, anyone could own a bronze tool. But was the supply and surplus of raw or finished materials controlled? Was this by restriction of knowledge, where only a select few could cast and recast bronze, with moulds made and deposited on settlement sites separate, separate from where the raw material was stored? Perhaps once an item was broken or there was surplus material from casting, the material was returned to a specific individual or group which need not be those that actually cast the bronze and who may equally have been under some form of control. If so, was the trade casting and effectively banking of bronze also carefully controlled that these processes were kept separate, cordoned off from settlements by those in authority? 
An extension of this is that access to the enclosure was restricted by behaviour or belief. And that in collecting material that has either been systematically or functionally broken or was surplus, they were returning the bronze to a sacred place. The enclosure may have been viewed as both a shrine and reserve of material that was overseen by the occupants, though on whose behalf, if not their own, is open to conjecture. If we accept social political power had a role in the control of bronze, and it seems unavoidable without being too capitalistic, was the collection of material effectively a tax? And were our occupants motivated or mobilized to travel around settlements with the collection of fragments taken from items a tribute or payment? This may have contributed to the wealth of a ruling group or on a more spiritual level as an offering to those representing a belief system, a sacred component of society, potentially even arranged around metalworking. Did the officious or ceremonial roles of our occupants involve traveling out to oversee the breaking of objects and equally dedicating themselves to the rites and depositing material in hordes and even praying to that material? My second proposition is a shift in location, but not the activities and roles I've just speculated upon. Rather than having the enclosure as a restricted space, Perhaps it was a central node in a network of settlements and routeways that punctuated the landscape of the Lower Thames. All of the potential officious and sacred tasks may remain, may remain valid, but did individuals or groups from the various larger settlements and farmsteads seek out and travel to our enclosure? Did they bring bronze items to be broken or fragments to contribute to offerings or reserves that were communal or claimed by authority? Perhaps they brought items to the site which were broken, so a piece could be retained and the remainder was blessed or permitted to be recast. It seems quite feasible that our roundhouse could have acted as a sorting sector in which material was quantified and inspected, much like my desk when people bring in archaeological artefacts. Given the alignment and arrangement of the site and hoard, I would speculate the hoard groups resided in a restricted space. Perhaps when the business of fragment selection had been completed and the supplicants departed, there was a process of ritual of process or ritual of deposition, potentially around sunset or sunrise. I can also envisage the horde groups acting as a cache of material, at least in a sense returning to the idea of the so-called founders horde. Perhaps bronze was redistributed from our roundhouse with an offering removed for the hoard. Or perhaps the hoards were not intended as a permanent deposit, but are the resource from which raw material could be bartered or requested to be taken forth to a settlement where an artisan could recast it. I can't offer a definitive role for this striking collection of four hoards, the Havering Hoard, but I hope these results allow us to reframe or at least re-question how many seemingly isolated hordes might now be reconsidered within a Bronze Age narrative. Before I say goodbye, or at least open myself to questions and discussion, um, I'd like to offer a few acknowledgements to those that have made the project happen. To Andy Clark and Ingraborn Valley for funding the excavation and continuing to do so very generously, to Claire Halpin and Archaeological Solutions for undertaking the excavation, in particular Joe Locke and all of the excavation team for all their hard work on site. Um, I must extend very special thanks to Pieta Greaves and Sophia Adams for their work respectively on conservation and metalwork analysis, which has been above and beyond. It's been inspirational to collaborate and contribute with Kate Sumnall and all her colleagues at the Museum of London in the development of the exhibition on the Havering Horde. They have created a wonderful vision of prehistory that I hope will engage with the public on many different levels. Um, I hope it will also engage with archaeologists. Um, so please go and visit um, in Docklands. I would say again, it's open until April. I think it's free entry, but you have to book a time slot at the moment. Um, lastly, thank you all for listening, um, and especially to the Committee of Lamas for organising tonight. Um, it's been a pleasure, and Harvey, I think I've overrun by a few minutes, so thank you very much for your patience. Um, thank you all.